Eagles Entertainment. Eagle Eye in the Sky is fueled by Gatorade, the official sports drink of the Philadelphia Eagles. Here's everything that move. I don't care who it is. Let's go. Give me everything you got. Play fast, play hard. Let's beat these boys tonight in their house. It's party time. It's party time. Let's go. Touchdown! You're listening to the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. Now here's your host, Brand Duffy. That's right of the week, and we've got a lot to discuss as the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade, continues. I'm Fran Duffy, and as always, I think we've got a great show for you here on episode number 300. Uh, it's crazy that we were at episode number 300, but uh, we've got a lot to talk to, so I don't even want to harp uh, on that milestone. At the top of this week's show, we've got Chalk Talk, where I chat with Greg Cosell from NFL Films as we react to the news that the Eagles and Doug Peterson have parted ways. The team announced on Monday through a statement from team chairman and CEO Jeffrey Lurie. Look, this is obviously a huge decision, not one taken lightly. Uh, Jeffrey said it in the statement that everyone in the building knows the kind of man and the coach that Doug Peterson is, future Eagles Hall of Famer, the coach who led the Eagles to their first Lombardi trophy. But this 2020 season was not what anyone expected. It did not go the way that the team was hoping, the way that the fans were hoping, and obviously the, the way that the media was expecting and projecting coming into this year, right? So where does this franchise go from here? What is the state of the team going into the offseason and the 2021 campaign? Greg and I will hash it all out there in Chalk Talk. After that, we wrap up this show by going through a fan question and some of the biggest differences philosophically between 4-3 and 3-4 defensive schemes and why that may not be the right way to talk about defense in today's NFL. So obviously that's going to be a big topic as well over the next few weeks. I'll hit on that uh, as well at the end of the show. Before we get to Chalk Talk, a couple of big things that I wanted to hit on. Number one, we are not going anywhere. No matter what kind of fan you are, if you're an Eagles fan or uh, just an NFL fan that loves X's and O's and team building, we will be here twice a week over the rest of the offseason. We'll be talking X's and O's. We'll be going through players. We'll be watching film. A lot to talk about, obviously, with the Eagles as they start this coaching search, but we will have a ton covered here twice weekly here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast and as well over on the Journey of the Draft podcast. So you can go check us out twice a week over on that show as well. The Eagles have the sixth overall pick in the 2021 NFL Draft, so we'll be talking about all the top players, all who, who are the best guys that you need to keep an eye on starting Monday night here uh, with the national championship game, Alabama and Ohio State. But we have got you covered uh, from wall to wall when it comes to the NFL Draft over over on the Journey to the Draft podcast. All right, uh, let's not waste any more time. Let's jump right in now. It's time for Chalk Talk with Greg Cosell. Let's get down to business. It's time for Chalk Talk. Well, time to welcome in my friend Greg Cosell from NFL Films. Greg, uh, as I mentioned at the top, our 300th episode, but uh, rather than touch on that, I think obviously <laughs> we've got a lot to, to kind of unpack here. And the purpose of this conversation, we're going to kind of go – position by position here with this Eagles team going into the offseason and the state of the roster uh, going into 2021. But uh, obviously some big news to really kind of comb through first, and that is the announcement by Eagles chairman and CEO Jeffrey Lurie that the Eagles will be parting ways with head coach Doug Peterson. Uh, That was released Monday, shortly, I would say mid-afternoon, not too long ago from when we were recording this. So I guess uh, just initial reactions uh, to that announcement and, uh, you know, obviously a a big change here uh, for the Eagles coming up here because no Doug Peterson, but then also no Jim Schwartz as well. Yeah, no big change. Uh, and, and you would assume that there'd be an entirely new coaching staff. We don't know how this will play out. Yep. Um, you know, th- the reality is, and, and you hate to say it, none of this, you know, you, you know, you and I are, it's never personal with us, but it, it's a league that's about results. And I think one thing that was probably looked hard at by the owner, Jeffrey Lurie, and I'm sure uh, the general manager, Howie Roseman, was the quarterback position. And when you draft a quarterback number two and he performs at a really high level and uh, is, is basically on the way to being league MVP, and then, and I'm certainly not in the building, Fran, but clearly, as we've seen over time, Carson Wentz has not performed at that same level. And uh, at some point, you decide, okay, what's the best way to get him there? And obviously, Jeffrey Lurie felt that bringing Doug Peterson back uh, was not the best way to handle that. So, uh, you know, I, it's funny. As soon as I, I heard what happened, here's one thing that popped into my head. And, and a very respected NFL head coach told me this years ago. He actually used to come in and watch tape with me on occasion. And he'd been a coach in the league a long time. He's an older guy, um, been out of it for a bit, but won a Super Bowl. 
And he said that when you draft a quarterback very high, and Carson Wentz fits that category, he said the job of the entire organization, not just the coaching staff, but the entire organization, is to make that guy a great player year in and year out. And somewhere that went wrong. And unfortunately, uh, in in this era of football, the coach normally bears the, the brunt of that and, and bears the blame for that. Yeah, it's certainly uh, going to be a big discussion here moving forward is uh, not only, you know, obviously, look, there's going to be a lot of decisions to be made in terms of the, what the coaching staff will look like here in 2021. But uh, let's get into the quarterback position. And, uh, you know, you brought up uh, they've got to be able to get Carson, you know, uh, get him right, get him back to the form that we saw 2019, 2018, certainly in 2017, uh, going off just based off what the film showed you. And we'll talk about Carson. We can talk about Jalen Hurts as well. What did the film show you in regards to Carson Wentz and the way that the offense can kind of be structured around both him and Jalen Hurts here coming up, uh, coming into the, you know, the, well, this offense moving forward? Let me just say this to start. My sense, again, I've not had a conversation with Jeffrey Lurie or Howie Roseman, but my sense is they've made a major investment in Carson Wentz. I believe that the organization would like Carson Wentz to be the quarterback. They've seen him perform at a very high level in the National Football League. So to me, the question is, what now has to happen to make Carson Wentz a great quarterback again? He's been there once before. And to me, the film tells you this. And I'm now I'm going solely by film, not personalities, not anything else, solely based on film. My sense is it has to start from the beginning. It has to start with the fundamentals of the position, the mechanics of the position, the footwork, the delivery, things that are all fixable. And we've seen him do earlier in his career, but it has to start there. To me, that will take care of some of the other concerns, such as the uh, inconsistent and erratic ball placement. So because we've seen Carson Wentz, He'll miss a few here and there, but it was never alarming. You never came away in 2017 and went and said to yourself, oh, my God, he's inaccurate. You know, every quarterback misses a few, but you never quite felt that way. So this year you started to feel that way, that, wow, he's missing a lot of throws. And I think it needs to start with the fundamentals and the mechanics of the position. All right, let's get to uh, to rookie quarterback Jalen Hurts. You know, obviously we got a four game sample size of Jalen. You know, at the end of the season, uh, what what are your thoughts on terms of what you saw from him based off the film over four games? And what was what are his prospects? I guess moving forward in the NFL. Well, I thought that the first two games, to be honest with you, I was surprised. I thought he threw the ball well. I thought he had a sense of timing uh, and anticipation with what they were asking him to do. I thought they did far more things tactically with Jalen. Jalen Hurts than they did with Carson Wentz. Uh, they may have done that because they felt that Hurts needed that kind of help to be effective and successful. Uh, and then in the third and fourth game, some of the issues that I think were evident uh, from his tape at Oklahoma and even before that at Alabama showed up. The inconsistent ball placement, um, moving when he didn't need to move, uh, leaving the pocket prematurely, not letting things develop. Those things started to show up. So at, at this point, look, I'm one of those people, four games is not a large enough sample size to make a judgment about a player going forward. But I think some of the things that we probably all felt were concerns coming out of, of Oklahoma it started to to show up and and he'd be a quarterback that would need some some work. Staying with the pass game, I want to talk about receivers. And obviously the big one that we have to discuss is Jalen Rager, the, fir- the rookie first round pick. I know you were a big fan of Jalen's coming out of college and and to kind of get your thoughts on just watching him in his rookie year and you know the takeaway now that again we're a, a week or so removed um from his final game yeah you know to me he was a tough guy to get a handle on because the pass game was so inconsistent and you didn't see targets on a consistent basis i think he improved as the year progressed as a route runner um you know obviously people point to uh, that that last game of the season when they went with the shot play and the ball was actually thrown a little behind him but people feel obviously he should have caught that ball um you know i think he improved i just think he was in an offense where you just didn't get a lot of targets i mean i would have loved to have seen him be in a position where you knew on a weekly basis he was going to get eight or nine targets but that's not the way the offense was i don't want to say the way it was structured we don't know exactly what they wanted to do every week but that's not the way it played out so he was not a volume target by any stretch um i think they tried to do more with him as the season progressed but it just it, it was it was kind of an erratic offense throughout the year 
Um, so I'm still a believer in, in Jalen Rager. I mean, I, I've never been a guy who, after one year, makes a definitive decision on a player. Um, I, I still think he's a very talented guy. And if they can get more stability and consistency, Fran, with their pass game, I think that Jalen Rager could be a very good player. There are so many examples over history of not just a receiver, but every position where give it time, pump the brakes a little bit, let's relax before we make oversweeping judgments on a player uh, after his rookie season. Hey, I know this was a long time ago, but he's a good buddy of both of ours, but I think Mike Quick caught 10 balls as rookie season. Right, yep. And obviously, those lines. It was yep. not – he hardly played. Yeah, uh, there's, I mean, there's example after example of example yeah. uh, as to why not to do that. Now, looking at the rest of the receiving core – the, look, the Eagles have decisions to make with the veterans there, with Deshaun Jackson, Alshon Jeffrey, but a, a bunch of other young guys in the mix that we got to see a lot of time for this year. And it, you know, all these guys had their moments. John Hightower and Quez Watkins from the rookie class. Uh, Travis Fulgham, who the team acquired off waivers uh, back in the summer. J.J. Ortega-Whiteside, the second-year, second-round pick, who I thought had some nice catches uh, in the finale against Washington. Um, of those guys... Are there anybody in that foursome that you're going into the offseason, just you personally, based off what you saw on film with the mindset like, yeah, this guy is going to be a fixture moving forward or all of them kind of in that same situation where you're like, I really want to see how they kind of battle this out in the spring and summer and we'll kind of let the cards fall where they may. Unfortunately, I kind of feel the latter because I yeah. just don't think they're – look – you know, did Quez Watkins show a couple of plays? Absolutely. I mean, you can think of that 32-yard touchdown on third and 20, the screen, which was actually a give-up play, and he made it a 32-yard touchdown. Um, you know, I think he's got some speed. Look, I liked Hightower coming out of Boise State. There were games in which he got a lot of snaps, and then, for, you know, obviously he got put on the back burner. So I don't know what, what Hightower is. You know, he made a couple of catches and had a couple of drops. But because there was no consistency to targeting, it. I didn't feel like I can answer that question about the yeah. receivers. It's tough. I think, and I think you probably feel the same way. A hundred percent. And even like you look at Travis Fulgham, you had that month where he literally led the, the NFL in receiving. And then we didn't see much of him over the last half of the year. No, for whatever again, reason. So, I mean, again, it's, you know, we're not at practice. I yeah, can't answer, you know, exactly right. practice habits or anything like that. But there was Fulgham to me is the perfect example. He was a high, high volume target player for four weeks, five weeks. And then all of a sudden he wasn't. Now, is that because of him? Is that because of the offense? You know, th these are questions they need to figure out in the offseason. Yeah, it's uh, certainly going to be interesting with that with that position. So many young guys there to yeah. try and get a fi figure out what that what the picture of that position is going to look like moving into the summer. Uh, let's get into the tight end position, and obviously uh, another decision to make here for the Eagles. Obviously, that the contract status of Zach Ertz is always uh, a big discussion point now. Uh, has it been as it has been over the last few months? What I find to be interesting is if Zach Ertz is not back next year. Uh, you know, I guess it'll be more of a transition when you talk about these receivers, these young receivers here, more of a transition away from 12 personnel towards more 11 personnel. You know, obviously with Dallas Goddard uh, going into, he'll be coming up on a contract year soon um, as a former second round pick. He's only going to have a four year deal, but uh, I'm very interested to see what this tight end room will look like here yeah. going into 2021 as well. And then, you know, the, sort of the elephant in the room, too, is is which you and I don't know because we're not involved with this, but there are going to have to be some cuts made just due to the salary cap. Yeah. But we just don't know. I mean, if Zach Gertz, it would seem like he'd be someone that would, would generate major discussion in the, you know, at the Novacare Center because, you know, he, he does get paid a lot. He's over 30 now. Is he someone that they feel, hey, because of Dallas Goddard and the fact that we'll probably have to pay Goddard, is Zach Gertz someone who's not there next year? I don't know. All we know is he's on the team now. So in an ideal world, you know, when you line up Ertz and Goddard, you feel like you have two pretty good tight ends. Now, again, this year, everything was so different this year just because the offense never had any stability to it. So there was never any sense that, oh, okay, we know that Ertz is getting 10 targets. We know that you know, Rager's getting six targets, you know, whatever the number may be. Right. There was just no stability. So it was, it was just hard to get a feel. So Greg, we've talked about the wide receiver position. We've talked about the quarterbacks, obviously, but I, I think a big pick position to talk about as well, the offensive line. And there are a lot of layers to that. And that was a big problem for what, you know, some of the inconsistencies they had on offense this year. What did the film show you from the offensive line here this fall? Well, for whatever, there are many reasons. It's very difficult to be a solid offense with so many changes on your offensive line. I think they need, as a staff, 
to really study this offensive line group, self-scout, and decide as they go into 2021 who the offensive line group is going to be. Because you just can't have that many changes. Uh, it's, it's just too hard to play that way in this league. So I think it, it does have to start there. We'll get to the quarterback, obviously, I'm sure, uh, the quarterback situation. As we speak today, obviously, Carson Wentz and Jalen Hurts are both on the Eagles, so we'll get to that. But I think your offensive line in this league, I know the Eagles, If and you'll know this, Fran, didn't they have more changes on their O-line than any team in the league? Or, it was the, I mean, in the history of the league, Greg. They had 14 different starting combinations, and that was more yeah. than any team had ever had. And obviously, so much of that has to do with the fact, like, you, you, Lane Johnson was in and out of the lineup. Right, and right. put on injury reserve. No Brandon Brooks, no Andre Dillard. So there were guys in and out. Isaac Sayamalo uh, in and out. The only guy that started all 16 was Jason Kelsey. So, uh, yeah, a, a lot of musical chairs there along the O-line. So, but putting that aside, and obviously there were injuries, no question. Yes. I mean, you just mentioned Lane Johnson, who's obviously a very, very good right tackle. Um, but did they have some decisions to make. Um, Andre Dillard started the season before the injury as the starting left tackle. He was drafted to be that. Um, we can sit and debate whether his his play as a rookie indicated that he should be a starting left tackle. That that's a coaching issue, and that's that they'll they'll figure discuss that. that. Yep. They'll figure that out. But the question is, Jordan Mailata ended up playing there, um, and then he got hurt. So, but Mailata ended up starting what seven, eight, nine games at left tackle, something like that. What were your what were your thoughts overall in Mylotta? Now that we can kind of take a step back, we're yeah. removed from the end of the season. Having him having st- started half the games this year, I mean, for a guy who's as young as he is, right. and experienced as he was coming in, what were your thoughts overall? Now walking away from the season, and I can only answer that based on film study, not being there because yep. you're talking about a player who obviously didn't even play football. So I don't know what goes on at practice. I don't know what goes on in the Zoom classrooms. You know, I don't know all all those things. You know, I can only speak to the film. And, you know, I thought that there were moments, snaps, in which he looked very good, like he had a future at left tackle. And then as he played more, there were also snaps in which I thought, you know, that that wasn't very good. And and I thought he'd be better as as he continued to play. So I kind of came away from the season feeling like, if he's a good worker, if, if if all those other things that I don't know about are all really good, that I think he could play there, but he needs work. Sure. That That's would good. be my thought. So now you have to decide, is he your left tackle based on the body of work this year and all those other things that the coaching staff knows? Or because you ultimately drafted Andre D- Diller to be that guy, do you go into this offseason with the idea that, hey – it's a competition, and we drafted Dillard to be the guy. And if he comes back strong, did he have a pec injury? Was that what it was? It was a uh, yes. It was a, a pec or no? It was a bicep. It was something. Bicep. It was on the upper body. Yeah, it was upper body. Bicep. So, bicep, bicep yeah. Right. If he comes back healthy, and you know, is he your left tackle? Because he they traded up to get him to draft him to be your left tackle. Yeah. And I think you and I both believed he had tackle traits with his feet and his athletic ability. Needed to get stronger. You know, uh, but. I think that's the first thing they have to decide is who's going to be the left tackle. I, mean, I, I think, I think too, the other big part of that, that I think fans will automatically point to is like, Oh, well, can't they just slide one of those guys into guard? And you know this, but I no. want to make sure for our, for our listeners, it's not always that easy. Not no. everybody can just make that transition from tackle to guard. Personally, again, just as you did, I studied Dillard uh, coming out of Washington state in depth. I don't think he's a guard. Now, Malad is 6'8". You normally don't see 6'8 guards. Um, Again, you know, Jeff Stoutland would know a lot better than I would. Um, I I do not see Malad as an inside player. Do you? Not especially, no. I do not view him that way. But I think that he – now, could he? Yeah, I mean, he of course he could. Of the two. Of the two, I think he's probably more likely, yes. Right, right. when When it comes down to it, the Eagles are going to try and put the five best on the field, and we, we'll wait to see what happens right. uh, with Jason Kelsey. If Jason Kelsey's back, right. you know who's at center? If who's at left guard? Does that Isaac Samalo have to move inside? Uh, there's so much that needs to be determined. I think it's interesting though that, and this is the the double edged sword of when you have all these injuries and you have so many guys play. They got eyes on a lot of young players. You got to Correct. see a, a really you know big sample size of Nate Herbig. You saw a decent amount of Jack Driscoll. We saw more of Matt Pryor. We saw so you started to get some answers on some of these guys. And so I kind of wonder, all right, if you go into the into the 2021, let's say Jason Kelsey's back and you say, all right, well, you've got uh, you know, whoever is your left tackle, 
You've got your left guard and say, Molly, you've got Kelsey, you've got Brooks, you've got Johnson, you've got the other person that didn't, who's not starting a tackle. You've got Driscoll, you've got Herbig. And if, he, if Herbig's your eighth offensive lineman, like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like now you're like, all right, we, we've got some young players. What is their ideal spot in the pecking order? And right. To supplement and, that depth. And by the way, obviously, Molata is the, the glamorous name, but I thought Herbig actually ended up you know, doing okay. I yeah. mean, I remember watching him at Stanford. Um, you know, he played in a pro style system where you saw a lot of gap scheme runs. The Eagles don't do a ton of that, but I think her, uh, her big over time, I thought there was improvement to his game. Um, I can't sit here and say, you know, he's your starting right guard. Obviously Brooks is due back tough injury to come back from, but he's obviously going to be the starting right guard until proven otherwise, sure. you know, so he'll step into that role, but you're right. I mean, if, if, Assuming Kelsey's back, you there's four spots that are pretty much blocked up. You got going from right to left, you got Johnson, you got Brooks, you got Kelsey, and you've got Sayamalu. So yep. the position you're dealing with is left tackle. Yep. I think it's going to be a really interesting discussion and uh, something that we'll certainly spend a lot of time talking about over the course of the offseason. I thought Jack Driscoll did some really nice things as well, by the way, uh, at right tackle. We saw a little And I don't think he's a guard either, by the way. Yeah, that's the thing. it's going to be really interesting to see ultimately uh, where he ult- slides in with this depth chart. Greg, let's talk about the running back situation because uh, obviously, look, there's been a lot of continuity. If you look back uh, over the Jeff Statlin and Deuce Staley uh, pairing there with the Eagles run game over the course of the last few years, we'll have to see uh, if that will continue. But uh, I want to talk specifically about Miles Sanders. Well, obviously, we got a little bit more of a of sample size with him as the starting running back here this year. Missed a couple of games here throughout the course of the season, but walking away from 2020, what are your big picture thoughts on, on Miles Sanders and you know his status with this team moving forward? That's a great question because I think he ran much harder this year, but the problem is then he got injured. So the question becomes, because if you're, if you're going to call a guy a true feature back, and again, that's a relative term. People have different definitions of that. But if you're pretty much going to say that every week we're going to give the ball to Miles Sanders, give him the ball. Not, not, I'm not talking touches. I'm talking about handoffs. Yep. 17 to 20 times, okay? Then he's got to be available. He's got to play. Um, now, he ran much harder, I thought. He had some games this year where he didn't necessarily have big yards. Um, I, I It might have been the second to last game of the season. Was that the game where he had 17 for 64 or something like that? I believe so, yeah. Yep. He, you and I discussed this in the podcast that week. He ran really hard that game. He ran game. hard, yes. There, was there were other games he ran really yep. hard. Yep. Um, so to me, he improved as a as an NFL runner because we know he has explosive big play ability. But if you're going to run like that, which is necessary, by the way, to be a true feature back, then you got to be on the field. Mm. So I think that's a question they have to answer as well. I mean, I love Miles Sanders' talent. And again, then you get into the pass game. I think he can do so much more in the pass game but again, it was a function of the offense not really having a rhythm to it in the pass game. As I said at the top of the discussion, I mean, the, the pass game itself, I mean, by every metric, just was not good no, uh, this no. year. And they've got it, that affects everybody, obviously. So uh, yep. you know, everybody uh, will be affected by uh, any improvements they make there going into 2021. Let's go over to the, the other side of the football. I, I almost you could have started here, and that is the announcement that uh, the Eagles made late last week, and that Jim Schwartz uh, stepping away from the game, and, and he has been such a huge part of this team's success over the Doug Peterson era going back to 2016. And to me, look, we talk about the play on the field. And as I said, this unit has been very, very successful. What I find to be very interesting, just because this, and Greg, you know, this is where my mind goes, is that when you have a unit where there is a set identity, and with Jim Schwartz, you knew what that identity was. You're, you're going to be an attacking front. It's going to be a front four. It's going to be a lot of the focus there. The resources are going there. Uh, it's going to be, you know, a single high defense on the backside. They'll play cover two on third down. You knew the kind of identity that you were looking for defensively at all three levels. So when you lose that from a, not just from a, oh, like the X and O standpoint, but even from a team building standpoint, having a, a coach where there, it's such a clear identity of this is what we need. This is what we're looking for. That hurts as well. And I'm very interested to see what the Eagles do moving forward. But uh, just if you can, just kind of speak to really the, you know, the, that, that Jim Schwartz scheme and what that has meant to this team over the last few years. Well, you hit it right on the head. You know, while there's not 30 different defenses, the fact is there are several different defenses. And each coach and each scheme has its own set of parameters uh, for particular players. So you're right. With, with, with the Jim Schwartz defense, certainly the one he had in Philadelphia, it required – four down linemen who theoretically could rush the quarterback it 
it in their mind, it did not require great linebackers, but you're going to play predominantly single high, so you need corners. And so that's what you're looking for as you go out in free agency and in the draft. So the question becomes, as you now look for another defensive coordinator, are you changing your defense to the point where you're looking for different kinds of players or do you bring someone in that has the same basic philosophy and then you're you're looking for the same kinds of players that you were looking for before and that becomes an organizational decision clearly we know and there's no right or wrong to any of this that linebacker was never a high priority position for the eagles over the last four or five years with jim schwartz now i don't know if that was a jim schwartz thing i don't know if that was a front office deal but obviously they did not view the linebacker position as a position where they wanted to put a lot of, you know, draft stock or, or money capital into. Mm. So um, we'll see, you know, there are some who believe that linebacker is an important position. Uh, so I guess we're going to find out how they view it as they go forward. But right now this defense is, is set up to be successful in a Jim Schwartz philosophy. Yep. So we'll see you know, where that goes. We'll see if they hire someone from, let's say, in sta- who's on staff now, who maintains the philosophy, or if they say, you know what, we want a total change and we're going to bring someone in from the outside. We don't know that. So looking at it from your set of eyes, looking at this defense over the course of this season, uh, what are the, the, from a personnel standpoint, what do you view are the, the biggest strengths of this group that you're looking into 2021 and you say, okay, this is where you, this is kind of the starting point of how you kind of build the image of this defense. Well, the strength is clearly the defensive line. Um, I think you you know you, you have to start there. That they, they have some really good players there. Um, you know, we don't need to talk about Fletcher Cox, the obvious ones. We know about Brandon Graham. I thought Josh Sweat clearly improved this year. Can I can I ask you about the so the two young guys up front that I, I wanted to ask you were, were Josh Sweat and with Derek Barnett. I, I'm interested to kind yeah. of get your thoughts on both guys. Um, we saw you know a little bit of both here playing out that right defensive end spot. How do you view both of them going into uh, you know go, going into this offseason and what yeah. the future could hold for them and both you know their their role and their usage uh, in an ideal sense moving forward. And again, all I'm doing is basing this on film study. Of course. I thought Josh Sweat had a really good season. Um, I thought that he was a factor both as a pass rusher and in the run game. I thought that he had a real good feel for setting the edge. I thought he was a good pass rusher. I thought given the snaps he played, because rarely did he play, you know, 65 snaps. And again, I don't know if he can play more because we know that he had a very, very serious knee injury earlier in his career. Um, But I like Josh Sweat and I thought he clearly improved. Derek Barnett, to me, is is a little too much right now of a splash player. He has moments. I remember against Trent Williams, there were snaps in which he totally dominated, Fran. I know you remember that. Derek Barnett looked like an all-pro defensive end for five snaps against Trent Williams. You know, if you saw those five snaps, you'd think, oh, my God, this guy's one of the top three defensive ends in the league. Right. But I I guess, to me, watching the tape, I always come away – uh, I just pointed because that's where my screen is. People have no idea. That's where my my video, my TV is. Um, you know, I, I felt like that there just wasn't a consistency to his game that leads me to, to believe based on tape study that he's going to be, a you know, one of those guys at defensive end. I right. still think he has to prove that. Yeah, uh, I think that'll be um, to, you know, because. And again, the the one of the focuses of this scheme was we want to come at you in waves, and you know right. you, you were fine with having a one A and one B along the defensive line at all three. You know we, we worked a three man rotation with Fletcher Cox and Malik Jackson and Javon Hargrave works, and I'm interested to just see how both you know that defensive end spot uh, will look here in 2021. I think that's uh, something certainly to follow. Let's go to the second level, and you brought up uh, the linebacker position. Obviously, a lot was talked about with this group coming into the year, and, and even over the first half of the year. But I feel like that that talk kind of quieted down a little bit in the second half, mainly because of the emergence of Alex Singleton. Uh, we saw a little bit more from TJ Edwards, a former undrafted free agent. Uh, Duke Riley kind of settled into his role as the third linebacker and playing in nickel as well. Um, look, how do you kind of view this group kind of going into the year? And remember, too, you've got two young rookies and Davion Taylor, a third round pick, and Sean Bradley, a fifth round pick. How do you view this group now going into this summer? I thought uh, Singleton was far and away the best linebacker on the Eagles this year. And I thought that they obviously felt the same way as he started to play because he literally played every snap for the last, what, seven, eight games. Right, um, yep. So 
I, I was really impressed with Singleton, and I see a lot of the league. Um, again, I'm not just watching him, so I'm not charting just him on every play. So I don't know how the coaching staff charted him. I sure. can't speak to that. I Just from watching the tape, I thought he played really good football. I like the way he plays. I think he was aggressive, tenacious, competitive. He saw it, and he went. Um, now, did he make a mistake here and there? Sure, he did. Yes, you know, sure. But I also thought he showed that he could potentially – have some blitz ability. They did, you know, they, they didn't use him very often that way, but I thought that he showed that he could possibly do that. Did you, did you feel the same Absolutely. way? No question. Absolutely. Yeah. So to me, I would look at Alex Singleton, no matter who is back. He's one of my, he's my starting, he's one of my starting linebackers. Now mm -hmm. he was the strong side linebacker in base. Um, TJ Edwards was the, the, the mic in their base. I think TJ Edwards is one of your classic sort of solid, base Mike run stuffing players. I don't think you in an ideal world want him playing in your sub, which they had to do for obvious reasons. They had a ton of injuries. Right. Um, they clearly drafted Taylor from Colorado in the third round to be a sub linebacker because teams play sub. You know, um, I, I think I have the numbers right here. Let's see with Philadelphia. I'll tell you right now, Philadelphia was in, let's see, nickel 53% and dime 15%. So almost 70% of their snaps they played sub now. So the question becomes with Singleton and if Taylor does become that guy with an off season, who's the dime linebacker? And unless they're going to go with the three, two, which that would necessitate an overall change in philosophy. Mm. And keep in mind too, that, that 70%, that's considering the fact that they played against three of the offenses in the NFL and correct me if I'm wrong, that you feel probably forced you to play base defense more than anybody. They played San Francisco, they played Cleveland, they played Baltimore, and all Correct. those offenses right. forced so you to play base. So even I those, uh, those numbers might even get a little bit higher. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess the opponents have come out for next year. I haven't looked at it yet, so I don't I don't know that offhand, but that's a yeah. great point you just made. So maybe it'd be closer to 72 73%. Yeah. I think Singleton proved that he should be on the field. So if you're going to play dime, and again, now you're talking about who the new D who coordinator, the coordinator. Yep, sure. you're going to play dime, only one of them can be on the field, unless you're going to go with a 3-2-6. And as I said, that would necessitate a change in philosophy. Yep. Uh, it's uh, that, That'll be a lot of fun just to kind of break that down over the yeah. course of the next few weeks. And uh, that will certainly be something that we do. Let's wrap things up just talking about the secondary. And uh, obviously the big, the big guy to talk about is Darius Slay. Was he kind of what you expected he would be for this defense coming into this season? For the most part, you know, they played a ton of man through the first eight or nine games, and then they played a little less man for obvious reasons because they didn't have anybody else at corner other than Slay, and he missed a couple of games as well. You know, so, you know, I think Slay, look, I think Slay gets beat once in a while. I think all corners that play predominantly man do get beat, yep. but I think Slay's a really solid NFL corner, and you feel pretty good about lining him up as one of your corners. That's a position to me, no matter who the coordinator is and no matter what the approach they decide to take coverage wise that's a position that needs to be addressed now whether they think there's someone in house whether they think they need to draft or sign free agents that that's up to the coaching staff but they have to be better opposite slay you know then you get into the avante Maddox discussion i like the player to me again purely studying and i watched him at pittsburgh where he was a boundary corner um I think he's a slot corner. I think if you put him in the slot, he'd be a really, really good player. Mm. Um, I think you need another outside corner opposite slate. That's my opinion based on tape. Yeah, I, I think that'll be um, certainly one of the positions that I know fans will be talking about most uh, going into the offseason. Um, you know, some free agents there and then the, on the inside as well at Nickel and Nickel Roby Coleman, uh, you know, and uh, Craven LeBlanc as well. So something just to keep an eye on here moving into the offseason. At safety, look, Rodney McLeod's going to be coming off that knee injury uh, and we'll see ultimately – what that rehab process looks like, how quickly he can come back. What is he going to look like coming back from that injury? That's going to be a question. Uh, the Eagles have some young safeties, Marcus Epps, Kayvon Wallace. Uh, they got some added snaps here on the back end. I want to ask you about Jalen Mills because uh, you know, making that transition from corner to safety, and he did have to dabble a bit at that corner yeah. for the reasons that you hit on earlier. Um, but overall, how did you feel that he made that transition? Because he is going into uh, uh, his free agent uh, year as well because uh, only a one-year deal last offseason. So just overall thoughts on Jalen Mills and how he made that transition. Obviously, the the scheme change could affect his his usage as well. Yeah, I struggled with him, and when I say struggled, I don't mean I didn't like him. I mean I struggled as to what he is as a safety, because to me he's not a post safety. And obviously, when McLeod was healthy, he was predominantly the post safety. 
and I'm not sure he's a box safety. Mm. So I, I, I'm, I know he had a lot of tackles, and then as you and I both know, that doesn't automatically mean you had a good year. Sure. Um, I just am not sure what he is as a safety, and that's that was my struggle. So depending on what the defense is, um, it, assuming you know if they stay single high as the foundational approach, I. <sighs> I, I don't know. I'm I'm really I'm struggling with whether I think he fits he fits in that role. So, you know, there were some games he he certainly was good and there were other games I thought that he was not very good. Mm. So, uh you know, he's a free agent you said, right? He is. Yeah, so I mean, I don't know how he's seen around the league. My guess is he's not going to get a huge money deal. So, you know, again, I don't know if he feels he wants to come back to Phil. Look, he's going to want the money and wherever they, he gets the most, I'm sure he'll go as he should. You know, <laughs> you never begrudge a guy the opportunity to do that. Um, I don't know what the league, how the league sees him because I struggle to see him, which doesn't mean I'm right. I, I just struggle to, to figure out where he best fits. Yeah, I'm I'm very anxious just to see it. I think that the the change in scheme could potentially affect either way, you know, whether or right. not uh he's back and then ultimately as well, how he's viewed. Is he a corner in a new scheme? Is he a still safety? How right. ultimately uh is he viewed? I think that'll be very interesting. Uh and again, some of these questions we'll start to get some answers to potentially uh in the coming weeks. But Craig, uh this has been fun all season long, despite the fact that it wasn't necessarily a fun season to cover. No, no. Uh, always fun to be able to catch up, talk X's and O's uh with you each and every week. Thanks for joining us every week here. Well, you know, quick point, Fran. I'm so so anxious to start talking about the draft with you because you know they do have the sixth pick and that's yeah. there's a lot of options at six that's the interesting thing so it all depends on, on how they want to prioritize what they need because essentially there's they could draft you know any number of positions and there's going to be a player probably worthy of the sixth pick there yeah, uh, there's uh, we'll have we'll be talking about that a lot on the journey to the draft podcast uh, throughout the the rest of the off season. So uh, you know, make sure I don't want to I don't want to ruin everything and then ask you about no, all no, no. things right now because we've no. already talked about so much. But yeah. uh, Greg, this has been fun uh, once again. Like I said, thanks for joining us here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade. Experience the fastest internet and more in a snap with Xfinity X5. You get the speed, coverage, control, and security you need for the ultimate in-home Wi-Fi experience. Xfinity proud partner of the Philadelphia Eagles. Well, great stuff there from Greg. You could follow on Twitter just like I do at Greg Cosell. And while you're at it, I'm at Eagles XOs. That's where I post all the podcasts I'm a part of and all of our X's and O's content that we produce with Eagles Entertainment. And you know I greatly appreciate everybody that promotes this podcast on all forms of social media. That's one way to support the show. But the best way is to go on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, leave us a rating and leave us a comment. I wanted to give a shout out today to someone who did leave a rating and did leave a comment with a question. Frank R99 left a five star review for the show and said, appreciate all the hard work you guys do with the off season upon us and Jim Schwartz expected to step away from the game. Could you name some potential replacements that may be in the discussion? Also, maybe an idea for an episode to explain the concept of a four, three and a three, four defense with the pros and cons of each. And uh, Frank really appreciate the question. I don't know, you know, in terms of like candidates, there are so many candidates out there, you know, whether you're looking at uh, guys that have done it before, obviously there are plenty of internal candidates. The Eagles have three coaches on staff who have been defensive coordinators in the NFL, whether you're looking at Matt Burke, if you're looking at Ken Flagel, where you're looking at Marquand Manuel. So the Eagles have three former coordinators already on staff, but uh, if they go outside the, outside the box, outside the building, there are plenty of assistants out there that they could talk. There are plenty of guys that have also uh, done it, uh, uh, at the at the highest level in the NFL, they're available as well. So uh, we'll see ultimately who those names are. But for the second part of your question, you know, I think it's really interesting. And obviously it comes up anytime a defensive coordinator position is open is, oh, uh, well, is this team going to go with a 4-3 or a 3-4? And I think really over the course of time, and I think if you look over the last decade plus in the NFL, there's been that evolution that we we talk about all the time, right? It's more of a passing league now. It's, more, it's a sub-package league. Th- teams are a nickel and dime more than 70% of the time. So that kind of takes away from the impact of 4-3 versus 3-4. To me, in my opinion, looking at defensive football, it is much more about are you placing your emphasis on your front or are you placing more emphasis on your coverage? And I think that is ultimately what you're looking for is what what kind of scenario you're going for because you're not going to be able to have blue chip talent up and down the board, right? You're not going to have blue chip talent really at all three levels. You can get there, but in terms of how you want to try and build your roster, the Eagles clearly, under Jim Schwartz, 
Where was the importance placed? It's on the defensive front, right? It's that one gap scheme, that attack scheme. We're going to get upfield. We're going to pressure the quarterback. Waves of defensive linemen coming in, coming out. You always want to be able to pepper the, the offense, uh, you know, with a, a multitude of weapons up front to be able to get home to the quarterback, affect the passer, and then let the coverage take care of itself. Now, you can decide whether or not you want to play one high schemes, two high schemes. It seems like there's a lot more trending towards teams playing more too high, playing too high zone. You look at uh, the way that the LA Rams played this year. Uh, you look at the way that a lot of teams, honestly, uh, are starting to play. Look at Matt Eberflus out, out in Indianapolis as well, what he's done with the Indianapolis Colts. So I think you look at and there's a lot of teams that are playing with more too high, but I think ultimately you, you got to kind of decide where are your resources going to go? To the front or are they going to go to the backside? And also, on top of that, I think a lot of people will say, oh, well, you know, look at what Bill Belichick has done. And, you know, you look at even where, uh, you know, what they've done down in Miami, and it's constantly evolving week after week. They're going to show one thing this week and uh, show a, a different look next week. That's all well and good. But you have to, again, you have to understand where your strengths are. And I think when you play a defense like that, if you're going to be really complex up front and have all these different looks and hybrid players and specific guys that can fit into specific roles, well, then you need your guys on the back end. You Think about it. We talk about this whenever uh, the Eagles play a team from the Belichick scheme. It's going to be a lot of man-to-man coverage. So you need guys that can play man-to-man, and you need a lot of them because you're going to play in heavy sub package. If you're going to play a lot of man-to-man, you need a lot of talent at corner. Look at what Miami did this offseason. They went out. Uh, you already had Xavier Howard, who was named an All-Pro. You had uh, you went out, signed the big-ticket free agent in Byron Jones, and you spent a first-round pick on a corner in Igbenogany coming out of Auburn. So you're putting a lot of resources into the, to the secondary, into the cornerback spot. Then you go back the other side and say, okay, well, what about the defensive front? Oh, well, we'll fix, we'll mix and match. You'll sign some mid-level free agents. You'll try and figure out a pass rush schematically, but you're not going to put a lot of money into that area. And again, you go back into the way that the Eagles have done it. And it's more simplistic up front, much like how the other scheme is simplistic on the back end, a lot of man-to-man coverage. Now you're going to say, okay, we're going to rely on our four-man rush. We're going to try and get home. We want to put a lot of money into guys like Fletcher Cox and Javon Hargrave and Brandon Graham and first-round picks and you know all those guys. You're putting your resources into that aspect of the defense. So ultimately, instead of it being a talk of 3-4 versus 4-3, I'm trying to get into the mode of, okay, is it going to be a defensive scheme where the resources are going towards coverage or resources are going towards the front? I think that's kind of an interesting way to look at it in today's NFL. Not necessarily 3-4 versus 4-3. There are going to be aspects uh, of a, you know, when you're if you have a 3-4 base, you know, there's there's going to be aspects of a 4-3 in there because you need to be able to get after the quarterback. So thanks so much to Frank. Appreciate the question. Appreciate the support uh, over on our Apple podcast page. And guess what? The queue is now empty. So if you've got a question, whether it's about a specific player, about a specific scheme, about a specific coach, anything related to the Eagles, related to the X's and O's, if you want it answered, now is the time. Jump onto our Apple Podcast page, leave us a rating, leave us a comment with your question there in the comment section, and we will hit on it here on the show. Look, we covered a lot here today. I'll be back a little bit later this week with Ben Fennell to kind of hash things out. Like I said at the top, we will be here twice a week here moving out through the rest of the offseason. So special thanks this week to Greg Cosell and all of you out there for your continued support of this show and all the rest of our podcast offerings on Eagles Entertainment. All that being said, I think that'll do it. Another show in the books here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast fueled by Gatorade. For everybody here at the Duffy House, I'm Fran Duffy. We'll talk to you later this week. Raise a glass to that comforting feeling of an Eagles touchdown with the all-new Broad and Patterson Wine Collection created in partnership with Wink. Featuring a Cabernet, a Rosé, and a Chardonnay, Broad and Patterson Wines are the perfect pairing for any occasion. Now you can bring the sweet taste of victory with you to a dinner with friends or to the tailgate with your game day crew. Purchase online today at philadelphiaeagles.com slash wine to stock up and have Broad and Patterson delivered right to your door. A portion of proceeds from every bottle benefit Eagles Autism Foundation.